For generations, coal has been a way of life for those in Appalachia. From the time our ancestors settled here, coal mining was the way to bring in money for families. Men, and some women, would spend hours upon hours working in mines. As someone from the heart of Appalachia, I have so many family members that have worked in mines that I can't even begin to count them all. But in the last couple decades, the coal mining industry has died down a bit. Between black lung, contaminating air and water, working in extremely dangerous conditions, and coal being a non-renewable resource, the coal industry has dwindled down drastically in the U.S., especially in Appalachia. But let's go back a few years. Let's talk about coal mining in the late 18th century and the early 19th century, specifically in West Virginia. During the time of the United States Civil War, West Virginia only had a few active coal mines, with less than 1,600 total miners in the entire state. But between 1880 and 1900, coal mining flourished. After many railroad companies competing against each other began to carve main tracks through the Appalachian Mountains, West Virginia ended up producing 489,000 tons of coal in 1869, 4,882,000 tons of coal in 1889, and 89,000,000 384,000 tons of coal in 1917. The quick expansion of the coal industry growing in West Virginia caused the coal companies to construct what was known as company towns. This was where the mining companies owned almost all housing, amenities, and public services. Miners in these towns were paid in coal scrip, which was where paper notes were issued by the mining companies that could only be redeemed at a company-owned store in the company towns. Kind of think of it as like a dollar bill, for example. If you go out of the country, your dollar bill can't be used in another country because there's different types of currencies. Let's say, for example, you want to fly from the United States to Thailand. When you get to Thailand, if you try to pay for something with your $1 bill from the United States, it is essentially going to be worthless because that's not the type of currency they take. The coal scripts in these company towns were like that. If you lived in one company town, you were issued a essential dollar that could only be used in that coal company town. You could not use it in the next one over. And that made people living in these company towns reliant and dependent on the coal companies that issued these coal scripts. And just as a side note, these company towns were very popular in other areas in Appalachia especially in eastern Kentucky where I'm from. So I mentioned earlier that mining was dangerous. Some dangers that one might find in a mine include the mines collapsing, suffocation, gas poisoning, explosions, and heavy machinery accidents. Those were all daily dangers. Before electricity, men often worked standing in water, swinging their sharp pickaxes and shoveling coal in the flickering light of their gas headlamps. What could go wrong? Between 1890 and 1912, West Virginia had the highest rate of coal miner accidents and deaths in the entire country. As a matter of fact, even during World War I, West Virginia coal miners faced higher risks of death than those soldiers who were fighting in Europe. So let's back up to the 1800s for a minute. In the late 1800s, the economy was crumbling. The Panic of 1893 was an economic depression in the U.S. that began in 1893 and lasted until 1897, and it deeply affected every sector of the U.S. economy. And as a result, some West Virginia coal miners joined the United Mine Workers Labor Union in response to the wage reductions following the Panic of 1897. But before going further, let's talk real quick about a couple important terms. First being labor union. A labor union is defined as a group of two or more employees who join together to advance common interests such as wages, benefits, schedules, and other employment terms and conditions. Because of the rough working conditions and the low pay of coal mines in the early 1900s, many labor unions for coal mines began to pop up. Another term we're going to talk about today is union busting. And that's what happened to these labor unions for the coal miners in West Virginia. Union busting is defined as an attempt by management to prevent employees from exercising their legal right to unionize. And a modern day example of union busting can be seen right now going on in Los Angeles with the writer and the actor strike. There are a lot of actors and writers who are striking against Universal Studios. And to try to bust these union strikes, Universal Studios has trimmed the trees where protesters were striking therefore removing their shade. For context, shade in Los Angeles is essential due to the dry heat. So Universal Studios is taking shade away from people that have worked for them because they're standing up trying to get fair wages, 
and better work conditions. So anyway, back to West Virginia. By 1902, the United Mine Workers in West Virginia had reached 5,000 members, striking in momentum as a tactic of the 1897 coal miners' strike. The 1902 New River Coal Strike in Raleigh and Fayette counties continued momentum into southern West Virginia and actually foreshadowed the upcoming violence in the massacre known as the Battle of Staniford. On April 18, 1912, both union and non-union members from the Paint Creek area, as well as the 7,500 miners from the non-union Cabin Creek, Kanawha, and Fayette counties all went on strike. The United Miner Workers set up tent camps for miners and their families who had been evicted from their homes without warning. So remember earlier when we talked about the company towns and how everything in that company town was owned by the mine, including the types of money they were given? So if you got on the wrong side of the company, you essentially had nothing. They would take away your home, your utilities, your access to even use the roads and bridges. And that's exactly what happened to the miners who decided to strike against the mine companies. Company guards even killed several miners during the first few weeks of the strike. These guards even equipped the trains with armor and machine guns. A specific example of this was known as the Bull Moose Express, which was used to fire upon the tent camps of the striking workers. So as a result, miners, with the support of well-known labor activists at the time, Mary Mother Jones, and the Socialist Party of America, acquired weapons and retaliated against the mining company guards. And later in that year, in November of 1912, the West Virginia governor, William Glasscock, declared martial law and sent 1,200 state troopers to confiscate weapons and ammunition to try to ease the tensions rising between the miners and the mining companies. To help you better understand what I mean, martial law involves the temporary substitution of military authority for civilian rule and is usually invoked in times of war, rebellion, or natural disaster. And luckily for Governor William Glasscock, martial law worked out in his favor. Because the Declaration of Martial Law reduced armed conflict in the winter of 1912 into 1913. But then in April of 1913, the United Mine Worker officials presented the Paint Creek Coal Companies with a deal. Compromise supported a nine-hour workday, accountability for minor compensation, and protection from backlash for union membership. After about a full year of work stoppages and fighting, the mining companies accepted the compromise from the United Mine Workers. And this compromise was also later on enforced by the West Virginia state soldiers. So things went pretty smooth for a while. Then on April 22nd and 23rd, 1920, around 300 miners in Matewan of Mingo County, West Virginia, joined the United Mine Workers of America. In retaliation, the Burnwell Coal and Coke Factory fired all union-aligned miners and gave them three days to leave their company-owned residences. Another company, the Baldwin Feltz Coal Company of Maywall, West Virginia, also did the same thing and evicted their coal miners who had joined the unions. So then on April 27th, Mingo County officials arrested Baldwin Feltz agent Albert Feltz for illegally evicting miners as a punishment for union activity. So the Mingo County Sheriff at the time decided to negotiate with these coal companies and they came to an agreement that only Mingo County Sheriff officials can issue eviction notices, not the coal companies. And as a result of that, the miners should peacefully comply. Miners in Mingo County continued to join the United Mine Workers of America, and miners continued to get evicted. So on May 17, 1920, the United Mine Workers of America set up tent colonies for the evicted miners outside of Maywan. Then on May 19, 13 agents of the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency returned to Maywan to evict miners from the Stone Mountain Coal Corporation housing. Remember that during this time, the coal companies could not evict the miners from their houses. Only the sheriff officials could do that. So Maitland Police Chief Sid Hatfield and the mayor of Maitland challenged the Baldwin Feltz agents. But these agents persisted, saying that they had permission to evict these miners from a local judge of peace. And they continued to hand out eviction notices to the miners while the miners and their families watched in horror. So local miners from surrounding areas began to arm themselves and made their way to mate one to defend the mining company from the corruption of the higher ups at the mining company. But what happened next has a few different stories. Some reports say that the mining agents tried to have officer Sid Hatfield arrested and the mayor tried to step in to intervene. And when the mayor did, he was shot and killed. But others say that Hatfield initiated the violence either by firing himself or signaling an ambush. In either case though, the Battle of Maitwan resulted in 10 people dying. The mayor, two miners, 
and seven members of the Baldwin Feltz Coal Company died as a result of the Battle of Maitland. And as a result of the Battle of Maitland, support for unionization increased. By July 1st, 1920, many more Mingo County miners had joined the United Mine Workers' Strike. Miners and mine guards engaged in several skirmishes over the closing of mines and access to railroads in the summer and the fall of 1920, but nothing too crazy. There were also a few strikes here and there that upset the state government, but nothing ever really came of it. There were a few strikes, though, that did upset the state government. And so once again, the West Virginia state government declared martial law and sent some troops down to try to simmer things down. But the federal troops backed down under a threat of a general strike of all Union coal miners in West Virginia. The general strike is a strike of almost everybody involved. This would admit that almost every miner in West Virginia was on strike. A man named Thomas Feltz, who was the Baldwin Feltz agency chief, hired a team of lawyers to prosecute a case against Sid Hatfield and the other 15 men who were supposedly involved in the Battle of Maitland or the Maitland shootout. But Sid Hatfield and the other 15 men were acquitted of all charges by the Mingo County jury. But the Baldwin Feltz Coal Company was dead set on making sure that Sid Hatfield was charged for something. So Sid Hatfield and his deputy, Ed Chambers, were also brought up on charges of destroying the Mohawk mining camp in McDowell County. On August 1st, 1921, Sid Hatfield, Ed Chambers, and their wives traveled unarmed to the McDowell County Courthouse to stand trial. But upon reaching the courthouse, Hatfield and Chambers were shot and killed by awaiting coal mining agents from the Baldwin Feltz Company. Miners in West Virginia were absolutely outraged by the assassinations of Ed Chambers and Sid Hatfield. And in the weeks following the assassinations, miners organized and armed themselves all across West Virginia. And then starting on August 20th, 1921, miners began rallying at Lens Creek, which is about 10 miles south of the West Virginia state capital, Charleston. And a few days later on August 24th, thousands of miners began to march from Lens Creek to Logan County, West Virginia. Many of these miners were armed, but some armed themselves with weapons and ammunition on their way to Logan. Logan County Sheriff Don Chafin had assembled a fighting force of approximately 2,000 county police, state police, state militia, and Baldwin Feltz agents to stop the approaching miners in the mountain range that surrounded Logan County. On August 25th, the miners began to arrive in the mountains surrounding Logan and fighting began between the two forces. Though Sheriff Chafin commanded fewer men, they were equipped with machine guns and they rented aircraft. And from those aircraft, they dropped bombs on the attacking miners. Then on August 30th, 1921, President Warren G. Harding threatened to declare martial law in the counties in West Virginia that were affected by the violence if the armed bands of miners did not disperse by noon on September 1st. A proclamation to declare martial law in the West Virginia counties of Fayette, Kanawha, Logan, Boone, and Mingo was prepared and signed by President Harding, and troops of the 19th and 26th U.S. Infantry were readied in Ohio and New Jersey to be sent by railroads to West Virginia. The Union leaders ignored this order from President Harding. 2,500 federal troops arrived in West Virginia on September 2nd, bringing with them machine guns and military aircraft armed with extra explosive and gas bombs from the recently concluded World War I. Facing a large and well-equipped fighting force, the miners were forced to stand down. Though the battle ended in clear defeat for the pro-Union miners, they ended up gaining a lot of support from the press in later years. Approximately 550 miners and labor activists were convicted of murder, insurrection, and treason for their participation in the march from Lens Creek to Logan County and ensuing the Battle of Blair Mountain. Following the events of the West Virginia Cold Wars, the membership of the United Mine Workers in West Virginia dropped by about half from 1921 to 1924. So there you have it, the unheard of civil war in America. Coal miners are one of the most exploited groups of people in the U.S. And this was where Appalachian coal miners were fighting for better working conditions and better pay and were beaten down and bombed by their own government. You know what John Denver once said? Almost heaven, West Virginia. Thank you.